before we get started, um, I just wanted to check in with the room and see, um, hopefully you all know your interceptions, it's about games in the classroom, but see if anybody had um, any, any goals with which they were attending this session so that we could make sure that we talk about them if we can. Any volunteers? There's enough of you that I won't like make you all go around the room. <laughs> Okay. So, question about evaluation. Other concerns, things you're curious about. Why are you here? Play games. To play games. <laughs> All right. Cool. I wanted to find some examples that I share with my colleagues. Cool. And what um, field are you in? Uh, I work at the Center for Teaching Excellence at the University of Maryland. Uh huh. Business simulations are considered games. Yes. Simulations are pretty much games. Yep. We'll, we'll count it. Leverage simulation is, the, I think, the term no one's been using lately. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm a graduate student, and I have not yet taught a course, but I'm interested in teaching research methods and statistics, which are inherently not classes that most people at the undergraduate level are super excited to take. Um, so I was excited to level. take research methods. So I love it, but I recognize that not everyone does. So I'm just curious about ways to make those topics more fun and interesting. Excellent. I don't know if we're making progress with here, so I hope you guys have more questions, more feels about games. Okay, excellent. Back there. So back there? How about games that are short and sweet rather than take up the whole yeah. Hey! <laughs> we'll talk about logistics. That's, that's as what well. I do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Dylan, give us a sound check. Say something to us. Oh, that was kind of kind of close to talking. Try again. Okay, well, we'll wait and see if we can do any better. Um, let me see if I can switch the sound real quick. Try the other mics, and then you're going to hear something like that. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, we should, we should move one of those mics. I'm certainly happy to just shout as much as necessary. Dylan, try again. No, no. Sancho, Sancho, Sancho. I think it's this more this just like phone. clear. I think if I could get... <laughs> Yeah, I get you. That's your computer fan. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I don't understand why the table seems so much better amplified than the speakers. All right. Well, um, so Dylan, we're gonna wait on you. You maybe can go to bed. He's in South Africa. Um, hang on. I'm gonna call you back when we're ready for you. Actually, I'm just gonna let you listen, and then I don't know what to do with this. So. We'll see if we can get that work to work a little better, but. So I have a quick presentation. Can everybody hear me or do I need to be mic'd? Generally, thumbs up in the back? Still? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm going to go very quickly, even faster than I had planned. Uh, and I just wanted to sort of lay some foundation for you and help you understand my perspective when I answer questions. So uh, the, the important question is who am I? Uh, I've been teaching games since 2003, so it's going on year 10 for me, actually going on year 11. I started making them back in 1986, off and on. Uh, and I've written more than 25 papers about games, um, largely social impact games and game design. Uh, one of the things that I write in all of these uh, different articles, book chapters, etc., is this idea that play is practice. Uh, and it's really important to understand play as practice, both from a developmental psychology perspective, a biology perspective, and a sociological perspective. So we can imagine a game like Tag as playing uh, Hunter and Hunted. We can imagine uh, things like playing Doctor as practicing situations or practicing roles when we play house, uh, or life skills like camouflage. Um, they suspect nothing. <laughs> uh, all of this sort of perspective is, is well informed. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, historical academic research in this area that basically says play is practice. So we can understand games as systems for practice, experimentation, and solution finding. So some games help us empathize, like Dark War is Dying. Other games help us perceive ambiguity, like Papers, Please. Others are used as recruiting machines, uh, like America's Army, uh, produced by the US Army. And <clears throat> others help us do things like reduce our energy usage. So this is a game designed for the Nissan Leaf that encourages people to be the best in their area at um, driving their car efficiently. So the big question is often, what are games? Games from James G's perspective, who's one of the most cited academics in education and games, 
is that games are learning machines. And I really like this, and I incorporate it into a lot of my work. So if we think of them as learning machines, then we understand that games have this kind of Darwinian evaluation. If you fail to understand the rules of the game, then you are kicked out of the game. You must force to, you are forced to leave. Basically, it's game over. And so as learning machines, it's really interesting to think of games as the sort of place that says, you either get my rules or you don't get to play. So what are these rules? It's always a really important question to ask about the games that we play. And a lot of those rules are about resolving conflict, right? So they're kind of prescriptions in how we deal with a problem. So some of them are about the rules of world conquest. My favorite thing in talking about risk is that it was done um, by a, uh, a French national at the same time that the uh, French were losing all of their colonies. So it's interesting that it's a game about colonization done by someone who really didn't, or someone from a country that was struggling with colonization. Uh, it also helps us understand things like rules of what matters, right? So if you've ever played chess, you know according to the rules of chess, the king matters and everyone else doesn't matter as much. So one of the things I talk about a lot is persuasive play, which are basically, uh, in, in simple terms, games designed to uh, help us understand a specific arguments, so games with rhetoric. The example I often use is Monopoly, which was explicitly designed by Lizzie Maggie back in 1904 as a game to help people understand the trap of landlording, why landlording is bad. Uh, or you could look at games like Life, which is my other really easy one, uh, and all this sort of rush to a payday because that's what life's about. Um, and making sure that you fill your uh, station wagon with 2.5 children. <laughs> so a lot of what I do, um, just so you understand my perspective, is this practice called <coughs> play, where I'm trying to encourage people to do things like hug more in games, or slow down, stop and enjoy the experience itself, uh, or trying to figure out how we can avoid stereotype in games, uh, or undoing atrocity instead of recreating the many atrocities we often do recreate in games or just lampooning our current uh, situation politically, right? So this is a game about the pitfalls of American insurance. So you're an adventurer who's got to go out into the world, uh, but you have to choose your insurance first, and then you have to make sure that your, your policy covers the accidents you will inevitably incur. Uh, and often they deny claims. So I have a bunch of games, uh, I do them very quickly, and I show them all over the world. But the question is still sort of what, um, why teach this type of game and these types of production? And part of it is that I believe game making is a 21st, edu 21st century educational practice. What I mean is that if you think about game making, it's about helping us frame problems, it's about understanding and asking questions that are critical of media, and it's about endeavoring for engagement. So not only am I going to teach you what I think is important, I'm going to try and find a way that ropes you in so you're really excited about it. Uh, and so I, you know, some of my students have produced really interesting games through this practice. Uh, this is Don't Kill a Cow. You can kind of figure out what you're not supposed to do, but you're always conflicted because that seems like the way to win the game. Uh, or a game about intergenerational, uh, sort of, I guess, intergenerational play uh, for high schoolers, basically helping them understand secondary school stresses. And so how do you do this? Well, if you really are interested, here's my plug, can't help myself. Global Game Jam will be here. Uh, we'll be doing a location of Global Game Jam, so come on down and encourage students to participate. Basically what happens is it's a 48-hour game-making binge. People come on, they come on in on Friday, get a whole lot of um, opportunity to make a game, and then by the end, they've made a game on a single theme. And uh, you can find more information at dcgamejam.com. We also have a proposed MA in Game Design proposed uh, and Persuasive Play, so uh, we'll be teaching more of this kind of stuff, and that's all I have. Yay. A very efficient use of time. Wow. Yeah. I wanted to keep us lots of time for questions. Right there, oh, right. Right. I know, right? Awesome. Just think how bad it's going to be Just for me. Say, I have to go yeah. through both of them. Oh, no. Oh, no. Say all the things. There we go. All right. So um, I'm recovering from a horrible plague. So, you know, uh, it's not really that. Pretty normal, actually. Uh, let's see. F5. F5. So good. Um, okay, so um, my name's Mike Trainer. I am a assistant professor in computer science here. I was hired this year to help Lindsay uh, build this uh, MA that has been proposed in persuasive play and game design. Great. Um, so I want to start uh, talking about who I am and what kind of work I do. Um, I'm a little bit all over the place. I have my foot equally in. Um, engineering, um, the arts, and the humanities. So uh, 
all of my, all the work I do starts with um, looking into game interpretation. Yeah, specifically, how is it that games can be about subjects? So we know how film can be about subjects. We, we capture the moving image and we edit together things. Uh, but how can systems and the unique aspects of games represent things? Um, this leads to um, the computer science and technical part of my research, which is in game artificial intelligence. Uh, specifically, I ask the question, what type of computational models are needed to facilitate these gameplay experiences that are about subjects? And then finally, game design and arts is uh, needs to be given equal footing to these other questions because just because we make a simulation or we make a computer model or a, a humanistic theory about a subject doesn't mean that is accessible to players. So uh, I really try to do all of these simultaneously and it's, it's hard. Uh, but we all, we all do hard stuff. So I'll give an example. Um, uh, a game that I was a lead designer and technical lead on also is this game Prom Week. Um, it has a silly fun theme where there are 18 students in the week before their big prom, and then you need to um, help shape how their whole prom week is going to go. Um, we chose this theme because it was uh, uh, easy to exaggerate and also um, you know, immediately accessible to people from the US, at least. Um, so in this game, what you do is you choose what social interactions characters take. So right now, Oswald is saying, what do I want to do with Doug? Do I want to show off, insult, bully, or woo? Um, and if you click one of those, you would go over here, and uh, this is a different scene, and they have a little dialogue scene that plays out that represents uh, or how those two particular players would react in that situation. Now, um, to people who don't play a lot of games, it might not be immediately obvious, but having enough dialogue to make that type of interaction work between any sets of two 18 characters across an entire week of gameplay is impossible. There's this authoring problem where you can't hand type everything, um, in game companies, people often, um, uh, in game companies, there are entire teams of people who do this for years before they release their games, and there's still less variation. Anyway, so enough of that. Prom Week was, is a great success. Uh, I, you should check it out. It's fun. Um, but so, now, here's how this connects to my vision of what makes games really special. Um, Prom Week enacts a theory of social simulation. This computational model that makes this dynamic gameplay possible is grounded in a very complex artificial intelligence system um, that, mon that it, um, helps make the player's choices really matter in the long run. Um, and I think this is really important because when you play Prom Week or you play one of these games, which I'll give another example in a second, you are actually learning how the system works. And therefore, when you learn how the system works, you're actually learning um, uh, you're learning a message that is embedded in gameplay, not embedded on the surface through just visuals or through cutscenes or text. And I think this is what makes games special. So another example of this, um, Kurt Squire is a games and education scholar. Uh, he wrote a dissertation and a lot of papers about this game, Civilization III. Um, this was used in high school history classes. Um, he and he, you know, used empirical methods to you know, prove this point. But uh, Civilization III was shown to teach students um, about the dynamics of history. And that's kind of great, because now you have critical thinking students, students who aren't just um, good at reciting the great conquest of kings and what years it happened in. You start to learn uh, about the way that the local economies of these various cities and, and the resource management and the, um, the, the various uh, political structures uh, create a emergent future for all the citizens of this imaginary civilization. And so teaching people about emergence and this type of uh, dynamic is, I think, important. So um, another example of this is this game Pandemic. <laughs> um, Pandemic is a really great example of an analog game or a board game um, that uh, embeds its message through its gameplay, through the system that uh, players engage with when they play. Um, so this is a game about a spreading disease and uh, a group of players collaborate together with different roles to try to manage um, the spread of the disease. Um, and so this teaches about how disease is spread and such. Okay, so um, just to summarize, three major... I got that. Okay, sorry. You can go ahead and turn that off. I think that's... <laughs> I was going to say, we're being blessed. I, I, <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> So, so now that I've set up this idea that, um, of why I think games are special, I just wanted to say how I think they could be incorporated into history classes or uh, sociology classes or any of this sort of thing, um, and of course technical classes as well, is I think 
game analysis is incredibly, <laughs> incredibly uh, deep. It's a very deep subject, and it's because what are the rules that shape this dynamic experience? It's not um, when you teach about why a game means something. It's it's a little different than ex explaining why a picture might mean something. Because there's actually this machinery under the hood, this system of rules that produces or generates a dynamic. And so being able to analyze that, I think, is a very valid skill. I mean, imagine if in the real world people actually thought about the systematic effects of their choices. Wouldn't that be crazy? It'd be amazing. Um, and then also it reveals, like, what are the hidden assumptions that go into your interpretation about this? And then next, you could have assignments about game design, where um, when you play test your game, it reveals problematic assumptions about what you think people will do in your game when they're engaging with it. Um, and then also, uh, that, like I just said, it requires critical thinking about the problem. So that, that's, that's my vision for games in the classroom and why games are wonderful. Thank you very much. I have two slides. I really don't like slides. Okay, so um, I'm a doctoral student in the School of International Service, and I like to say that um, the real proof of the teaching value in games is that I am willing to use them. Uh, because I, although I do have a background in simulation design um, and things like modern United Nations and debate simulation and things like that, and doing that as a teaching tool for young people, um, I was never a game person. Family game night at my house is kind of a struggle. Um, I just didn't, never really liked to play games, and I had a lot of problems with the way I sort of was seeing other people use them in the classroom, and I actually didn't really want to use them uh, in the classroom. And then last year I was coaching a class with Jill and Greg, who is hopefully still listening, I hope. Um, and we were teaching world politics. And one of the things that you often teach in world politics is um, different theories of world politics, many of which utilize examples from game theory, and particularly this game, The Prisoner's Dilemma, in which you have two prisoners who've uh, committed a crime, presumably, and the police basically offer them a deal um, in separate rooms that if they um, talk or don't talk, right, they have different outcomes, which are explained here, right? And it's basically what you really want, the incentives are aligned such that you want the other guy to keep quiet, right, and you want to confess because then you get the best deal, right? Which results usually in both people confessing, right? Unless you do things like play the game over and over again. So we were, which proves sort of different points about different international theories that are not important right now. Um, but we were using this game, we were having our students play this game with each other to A, prove that that was how the outcomes fell out, right? To prove that, in fact, they would choose to rat out their buddy more than they would probably choose to be quiet. Unless we let them play it over and over and over again, in which case they could develop some kind of rapport, right? And they could learn to trust the other guy to keep his mouth shut. Great. Um, so that was fine, right? I wouldn't say it was fun, but it was a thing that we did. Um, but what I realized about it after we did it, not that it was like super fun and that, man, this was the greatest teaching tool I ever used, but that it gave me this frame of reference, not just for an experiment that we talked about, but for a thing everybody had done in common. So I could use this example, I could reference the, not just the idea of Prisoner's Dilemma, but the experience of playing the game in our class discussions as the term went on. And I didn't realize it was super useful until I was teaching constructivism, and I asked them, who wins Prisoner's Dilemma? And they gave me this long explanation about, well, it depends what the other guy does. And I said, no, no, who wins Prisoner's Dilemma is the police that get to make the rules. And then we had this like really important moment of learning, right, from having played this game together. That was really more about the experience of having had that common reference point, right, for an experience in a game. And then it was about sort of oh, well, I, I sort of read all these things and I understand them, right? It gave them an intuitive understanding of the theory that was at play because they had to interact with it. It gave them an experiential knowledge of the rules rather than just sort of a read knowledge of the rules. And we talk about a theory of the world, right, a theory of international relations. We're basically talking about a simplified set of rules, right, that we hope will predict and produce certain kinds of behavior. Um, and that's what a game is, right? And this was sort of what made me go, oh, maybe we could come back to this game thing. Maybe I could get excited about this again. Um, <laughs> So then this summer, I was teaching um, some college credit classes for high school students. Um, and one of them was an engineering class where we played some cool games that I don't have some time to explain right now, but they were all about sort of developing creative thinking skills. And it was the most popular part of my class, and that really convinced me we could get on board with this. Um, but the game that we played sort of most extensively was this game, Pandemic, which Mike talked about, yeah, in my global public health class. I like this game 
Um, it's a collaborative game, as he was explaining. Every, every player has a different role. Um, and they're basically collaborating right, to cure diseases at a global scale. Um, they encounter all sorts of random events and all sorts of things that um, make them have to cooperate and think fast, um, and all sorts of um, arbitrary things that are assigned by the game right, through random event cards, but that are supposed to replicate real experiences of trying to solve epidemics. Now, I have to tell you, before I adopted this game at the behest of my partner, Vincent, who really does like games, um, I was giving this, I was trying to connect them with what is, what is really hard about public health and doing public health at a global scale where you have to coordinate among all these actors and all kinds of unpredictable things can happen and you have to manage a resource and the world moves just so much faster than you can really think about it. And I did that with a two and a half hour lecture on Haiti. And as you can imagine, that went over pretty poorly. Um, and then we were in this great game shop in Berkeley where I was teaching and we found this game and Vincent said, you should teach with this game and I did and it was great. Um, <laughs> That's not the end of that story. But um, it, and the reason that it was great right, was because it gave our students a common experiential reference point of interacting with a set of rules. Um, and it gave them something that they had done together, right, an experience they could all reference. Right? And I had a range of students. I had a student who was 45 minutes from home and had never left the state. I had a student who spent most of his time in Kenya with his dad, who worked for the UN. They had a wide range of personal experiences that did not always overlap with each other. And having a game that gave them a common frame of reference to talk about concepts in the class was really, really valuable for them. It also meant that all these things we had been sort of talking about conceptually, like um, the challenges of international coordination, right? and how different incentive structures are aligned and how that affects what, what different countries and different actors do in an international setting, it gave them a reference point to discuss that and it gave them a way to interact with those rules and see what their limitations were. Um, it also only takes 45 minutes to play, which is my favorite thing about it. Um, because that meant that I had an extra half an hour after that for us to do what I think is the most important part of teaching with a game, which is talking about it after the fact, right? Which is what Mike was just talking about in terms of game analysis. Because we could play this game, we could talk about why it was hard and why they lost, and, or why they won. They usually lost. Um, it's a hard game. But we could also then say, okay, well, how would the game have been different, say, if, if you were the one to discover the cure for the yellow disease, right here, right? If you were the one to discover the cure for the yellow disease, every time somebody used that cure for the rest of the game, you got a dollar. How would your gameplay have been different? Right? We could talk about how, how would the game have been different if different rules were different. And that allowed us to engage more deeply with this idea of what are the rules and how do they shape what's possible in this particular space. Right? It doesn't prove that the world is pandemic. That wasn't the point. Right? The point was to engage more deeply with Okay, how do the constraints on these behaviors produce the kind of outcomes that we find so puzzling in global public health? Because I could give this two and a half hour lecture on Haiti, right? And basically they would say, how could we let this happen? How could we let this just mass tragedy sort of compile on itself and get worse and worse and worse? And why didn't we do anything? And I, you know, this gave us a frame of reference to say, well, it's not that nobody was doing anything. Here's how the structures in place, right, can sort of pile onto each other and make it really, really hard. Um, I'm going to sit down now because that's my last picture. I hope you all really enjoyed it. Um, but I just want to talk sort of from those examples um, some sort of broad themes about um, why we might want to use games in a classroom, right? So first I think this idea that you have um, the ability to understand concepts like uh, the interconnectedness of politics and economics, right, and civilization. Um, these, these complex interconnected concepts that are much easier to understand if you can interact with them, right? The rules are revealed through playing the game. Um, is really, really valuable. But I also think this sort of touchstone experience, especially when you teach a very discussion-based class, it's really frustrating, right, to have this divergence emerge in a discussion where some people have frames of reference that allow them to engage the content in a particular way. Other people don't have that experience, and they can't engage it in that way. A game provides a common experience from which to sort of have that conversation. Um, and then also I think games are, they're a social interface, right? A lot of the games, um, that I use in my classes are they're collaborative or at least they're, they're games you play with other people in the room. Um, there's also lots of learning values right, to games that you play on your own, but in my classroom I mostly use social games. And that provides a social interface. People get to know each other better. They have an experience in common. They're not just sort of sitting in a classroom looking at me and then I ask them to talk to each other and then I'm basically asking them to have a conversation about their, their worldview and values with total strangers. Right. A lot easier to have that conversation through the mechanism of a game. It gives some sort of facilitation to that sort of social component of class. Um, I have some other stuff, but I think I already talked about it. Oh, the one other, um, my big concern, the reason I was 
really not on board at first with this idea that we should start doing things like incorporating games into the teaching of world politics, for example. Um, I had this whole conversation with my students about whether we should use risk to teach world politics. And what I found was that in that sort of impromptu discussion, it was really interesting to four people. And when I looked up, I could see at least three more for whom this whole conversation was communicating, this is what IR is about, and it's not for you. And it's not about people like you. And if you don't think this is fun, you don't belong here, right? And that was my concern. I had a real concern about that. Now, I think there still would have been an effective way to incorporate that game, right? You have it as one of a range of experiences, and you have it in an intentional way. But I think it's really important to think when we're choosing um, games to use in classrooms and simulations to use in classrooms, what our selection of those games says about what priorities, what ways of being, and what required prior knowledge are privileged, um, not just by the game, but by our discipline and by our classroom, right? Who does this speak to and who does it exclude? Um, and also, what does this communicate to the student about what the subject of study, what the discipline values and how it's done, right? What's important? I could teach IR through risk, and I think you maybe could guess what kind of students I would produce and what they would think was important about the world if that's the only mechanism that I had to teach. And they probably wouldn't learn a whole lot about cooperation, and they probably <coughs> wouldn't learn a whole lot about humanitarianism, and they probably wouldn't learn a whole lot about long-term collaborative development, right? Probably not so much. They would learn a lot about war, maybe. And wars that are fought at particular times in particular places on battlefields, right? So I think it's important to think about that. And then to speak to the point that somebody raised, uh, I think it is important to think about the logistics of the games that we incorporate into our classrooms. Um, how much time do they take to play? Um, I don't mean to hate on risk. It's just a running joke in my house. But it does take a really long time to play risk. Um, what's, you know, is it suitable, suitable for the size group that we have to deal with, right? Pandemic worked great when I would have four to six students. It worked real bad when I had 14. Um, you know, just the, the, the appropriateness of the sort of logistics of the gameplay for what we're doing. Um, I'm sure we could sit up here and talk all day, but I think, questions? Do you have something to add? Sweet. So there's always the opportunity cost of doing a game versus Absolutely. doing something else. Mm -hmm. So can you guys talk a little bit about uh, uh, the way that you get your lessons through better, more effectively, more concisely using a game versus doing something else? Yeah. Sure. So um, one of the ways that I often frame it and I, as I'm trying to put together my courses, I ask myself whether or not I'm looking to produce new knowledge or just impart some information. Mm -hmm. Games are really great at helping produce new knowledge because what's happening is that they're learning from experimentation and they're learning from practice. Mm -hmm. So if I have a gray scenario that I want them to understand the gray from, I have games for that. And if I want them to understand something that you really have to experience to get, then I have games for that. But if I'm trying to deliver an understanding of um, a particular art movement, and I need them to know some like hard and fast facts. That's sort of good old-fashioned, old, -fashioned, old um, approach. There are some games that are very good at it. Uh, a lot of people have been using um, Assassin's Creed lately to help people s sort of experience um, Italian architecture. But generally, I go for production of new knowledge. Mm -hmm. I'll say from a I'm from a technical discipline, so when I'm um, I, I think playing games that have particular uh, computational or uh, process-oriented uh, interesting aspects uh, what, uh, are really, in class, is really great because you see when people play a board game, especially these very very complicated ones, I mean, pandemic's pretty complicated, it goes even further, um, you're actually doing what the computer does um, by hand very often, right? And so it's a really good way of um, thinking about designing games is by playing these games in class and then talking about how, like, oh, how might you have impl implemented that giant booklet that you had to look through and make some key out of rolling dice and all this stuff um, in a uh, computer game. And for me, I um, try to look for things that I can leverage for sort of multiple interconnected lessons. So for example, um, I only started teaching with Pandemic about halfway through my summer. Um, but I'll probably be teaching the same course again next year where we're going to use Pandemic instead of the horrifying Haiti lecture. Um, and then I have assignments that I can build after that that allow me to then bring into the experience of having played the game just on that one day. But then later, I'm able to bring that content back, right? Same thing for Prisoner's Dilemma. We only actually did that for about 15 minutes. 
Mm -hmm. That was 15 minutes of my day. Did we talk about it 14 more times in the course of the semester? Yeah, and it provided this sort of shortcut touchstone. So the, the sort of time, you know, the time that we gave up to sort of go through how do you play pandemic and play the game um, was made up, I think, later for having had this sort of common touchstone that made it much, much easier to discuss other concepts more quickly. So things I think that you can leverage sort of repeatedly in lots of different contexts, I think, is, it really helps sort of make it a little more worth it. Because I'm with you that it sometimes takes a lot of time. You know, something you threw in in your presentation that should be emphasized uh, if you're thinking about using games in a classroom is uh, the studies show, the science shows that you really have to discuss the gameplay in class for it to actually be more effective um, than the other, well, I guess, than just playing it or reading a book. Yeah. Um, but there are studies that do show that. Yeah, the debrief is all about the debrief. With younger students, though, I was surprised when you, and maybe I misunderstood, that you could use the games for new knowledge. I thought it would be good for critical thinking, but for reinforcement, particularly when you're you know, doing math facts with a uh, character. At what point can you introduce new information? Uh, at what grade level, what age level, using a game? <coughs> Are there examples? So, yeah, if I'm understanding your question, it's, it's about um, when we give them the more challenging games that require the sort of production of... It, it's more, it, maybe I misunderstood when yeah. you were talking about, because we, we have used uh, games in the classroom for critical thinking and yeah. analyzing, but also just um, uh, reinforcement, memorization, sure. Sure. and all that. And so, I, like I said, I maybe oh, misunderstood. Okay, that. so the new knowledge thing has a lot to do with um, all of the, the theories and, and science around play, and play being the space for experimentation. Mm -hmm. So the reason that I, I, I look at it as a sort of the opportunity to produce new knowledge is that uh, it allows you know, some of the activities that uh, Mike was mentioning, I do the same. So it allows people to take, say, critical distance on a particular topic. If I give them a social impact game, I, I you know, it's a good place for me, because these games are sometimes two, three minutes long, for them to say, oh, I never thought of it that way, or now I can see it from another perspective. And that's why I explicitly mentioned games like Dark Horse Dying, because that empathy is extraordinarily powerful. I have a strong bias towards digital play. Um, I think that the, the stuff that happens in board games, and I teach board games too, are really great, but they have so many of these other um, social nuances that uh, what's really interesting about the computer is that assumption that the computer is non-biased. So then the critical media part comes in when I go, wait, 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 there's a rule set here. Ask yourself about that rule set and ask whether or not it's bias-free. So um, when we digitize these games, even existing board games, we then are incorporating all these other assumptions about the way the world works, what's valuable, what's important, et cetera. And so I'm trying to help the students see that and unearth that as part of a critical media study. Okay. And by the way, since you're raising the point of using games to teach with younger children, I have to say, um, one of the people that has been, one of the groups of people that's been incredibly helpful um, to Dylan and I as we've been doing research on this, um, is the folks at Labyrinth Games on Capitol Hill, who I would give a shout out to. Um, they are all analog games, um, and, but um, Kathleen, who runs it, it's her store. She is super, super involved in using games and teaching and using games for their educational value and their um, uh, developmental value, so in terms of developing social skills and different kinds of skills, and she's a, a font of information, and also it's a great place to just go play games and, and, and look for good ideas. Of, you know, you play a game and you go, I can use this, this is how I can use this. So if you're looking for a place to go play games, that is the one that I encourage. What's her name? Her name is Kathleen, and she runs um, Labyrinth Games on Capitol Hill. Everybody who works there is great. I'm biased because a couple of them are my former students. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, Lindsay, I'm if you could talk about a little bit more specific about what a game that takes on stereotype looks like. Sure, sure. So, um, my game, uh, Black White, what happens is uh, all of the player characters and the non-player characters look exactly the same. It's the same sprite I'm using across all of them, the same game character. But uh, you have to detect threats from non-threats. You can stomp on threats. You need to be nice to threats. They won't hurt you. I'm sorry, non-threats won't hurt you. So what happens is the way you detect a non-threat from a threat is by examining their behavior. So as you approach them, they act aggressively or they fail to act aggressively. And my critique was that too many games, particularly of the sort of platformer era, so think Super Mario Brothers, always have a black and white line. A bad guy looks like this, a good guy looks like that. And so that sense of stereotype, I think, if you think of games as practicing spaces where you're doing something over and over and over again, particularly digital games, uh, that frustrated me. So I thought, why don't we have people practice examining people by their behavior instead of their appearance? Uh, something that games also 
Um, I, I have an example from the Prom Week game that I talked about uh, that really deals with stereotypes. Is that there are two characters, uh, or one character, Nicholas, um, who the, there's a level goal, which is to get him a meaningful relationship or something by the end of the whatever. Um, and our Playtrace data shows that people had a really hard time with that, uh, with the level where they had to do that, because the only what uh, the only person who Nicholas could get with without a whole lot of puzzle manipulation was Oswald, his friend. So there's this assumption that most players had going into it, which, well, Nicholas is an homosexual, like, of course not. And then um, the players who do solve it, you can just tell that it took a lot of people forever to solve that level. So there has to be like some sort of aha moment where like, oh, God, I just didn't even think it mattered. Oh, my God. You know, just gamers are. But that, that's the way that games deal, make people confront their assumptions and their, like, their type of stuff. In the middle of the book. Yep. Me? Yep. Um, so if you're positioning a game as a fairly chunky experiential thing right in the middle of a course, mm -hmm. what do you do about axis? Mm. What do you do when two, like, a, so it's grad class, there's 13 or 14 students, two of them are missing, and you've sort of pinned a lot of what happens in the back end of the class mm -hmm. on having had this experience? So, so one thing is having a, a library that helps you build a collection. And um, you know we're, we're starting to do that here. And uh, that way you can assign it. It's like, OK, I'm sorry you missed the class. Go find two friends and check out the game and play it. Um, and then also, if, if you were a student and I were to give you a hint, a lot of games have YouTube uh, playthroughs of them. Most games, because people get very excited about their game playing, so they like to record themselves playing. <laughs> and so you could probably just watch it, uh, get a playthrough for 20 minutes and get a lot out of it. But it's not the same at all, right. if you don't have an ex experiential thing. But if you're just trying to get through, a student could do that. So the student who's late and you need to catch them up, the playthrough might substitute at least for some context? Yeah. So, um, one of the, I'm, I'm Sam Metis, I'm uh, an adjunct with SOC. One of the <clears throat> journalism courses um, on certain days, there'd be a mock um, news meeting, morning news meeting. You know, fast paced, people throw out ideas, and you go through and you analyze, you know, why, why is that going to work? Why is it not going to work? Why is it a good story? What is the potential for you getting it? You know, all those kinds of permutations, right? Help me understand why what you do might bring more value to that kind of a game, which is you know, purely analog. So from the digital perspective, is that the sort of like what? Okay. From a so, digital perspective, or is there anything in artificial intelligence? Uh, sure. So I'll let you answer the AI side if you've got some thoughts. But on the digital side, one of the reasons I have that very quick slide, as many of my slides are very quick, around um, uh, learning machines and James G's sense for learning machine is there's some real benefits to digital play. Uh, think about the fact that computers generally don't tire, so um, you don't have to worry about, let's say we're going back to sort of games about practicing specific skills, like I'm going to have you practice your Mandarin Chinese. If you're really slow at getting your Mandarin Chinese, the computer doesn't look at you and say, one more time, ni hao, right? But, but people do that. Uh, and so what's nice about digital play is that sort of one of the senses of a learning machine is they are tireless, right? And they're also a bit... Um, sort of, like I said, they're a little cutthroat. The, the stakes are high, and ideally you're engaged in those stakes, but that's true of role play if you are worried about the social dynamic of that space. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say that digital play does that much better, but it does have a slightly levered benefit there. Um, my big one right off the bat is just the sense that um, they, they don't tire, they can be persistent, they can do all the things we like in teaching, right? So they can give consistent evaluation, ideally unbiased evaluation, they can give, um, I have this lecture that I, I used to give, I don't know, five or six years ago, about um, helping people understand that a lot of games actually have an intrinsic rubric. So the example I give, I love car racing, is Gran Turismo. And there are all of these things, it actually has tests in it. You can't matriculate up until you are able to break within this distance appropriately, until you're able to do a slide turn, et cetera. And so what happens is you're highly motivated because there's this beautiful world on the end of that, but you have to get through all of these tests. And it's very much like a, a competency test anywhere else. But what's nice about it is you can do them 100 times if you need to, and there's sort of play anyway. Uh, and you have a very clear rubric. It's not as though, um, you know, sometimes we let things slide as teachers or we miss something. And, and what's nice about the game is it, it's always the same. Will you take out the human? 
aspect of it. Yeah, the problem is you've taken out the human aspect of it. Well, right. Yeah. But the benefit is there's some times when it's good to have yeah. the human part out. Yeah, that's the thing. I think there's, it's, it matters what your, what your learning objectives are and what your goals are. I mean, part of the great thing about a simulation in that sense, right, is that you have students taking on multiple elements of thinking, right? They're suggesting stories, but they're also responding to other people's ideas and thinking through the consequences of things that, you know, they didn't come up with on their own. I think there's there are some really unique, valuable assets to, to social game experiences and to social simulation experiences. I think there's other learning objectives or an individualized experience that, you know, doesn't interfere with the learning objectives at yeah. hand, certainly, and may, may really deeply facilitate, you know, what you're going for. All the reading of social cues, all these things that are very difficult to, to encode in any way are, are being practiced in your role play. I believe in play. It doesn't have to be digital. People are trying to encode those things in yeah. massive AI systems. <laughs> that's true. Okay. I think this lady in the light green shirt in the back. Yeah, that's because I have two beginner questions. I have no idea what you guys were talking oh, about. Oh, no, we're so, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, my question is, are there um, game templates where you can build in the content so it's applicable from statistics to neuroscience to whatever. And the second one is the more basic one. Where do I find these games yeah. that are respectable and that address certain contents? Because I have no idea. Uh, I mean, I don't know how to. I'm sure. not into game theory, but I do want to use games. In the class. So the best place I generally direct people is to look at the games that have been vetted and evaluated by sort of folks who know. So um, most conferences, most major conferences within education and games or within this larger space of games um, do sort of have these websites of like their best of each year. So for Social Impact, which is one of my foci, uh, the Games for Change website has a list of explicit sort of winners and um, games that they say they give a thumbs up to. Uh, Meaningful Play Conference, which is what we were talking about earlier, does the same thing every two years, and it picks out about of the of the games that are submitted. So I've been the jury on these things. So um, I was the jury, one of the jury members for uh, Meaningful Play, for example. We get about 60 submissions, and we choose about 15 games. So instantly we've kind of gotten rid of things that we just don't think are noteworthy. Uh, and then the efficacy is really important for the conferences, because the conferences, what we're worried about is not only showing that we have a game, but the game has been effective, mm -hmm. because we're academics. And so um, going to specific conferences will work out really well for you. Uh, and then there are some foundations who have tried to create their own repositories of thumbs up uh, style. So if I say Google games for college students, I would get these sites? Um, you should just email me and I can send you a list. <laughs> because there's a lot of noise out there. I have a more analog answer to that question, um, which is that um, I, there's, your question has two parts, so I'm going to talk about the first part first, which is this idea of are there sort of empty templates we can right. sort of import content into. And I think there's a yes and no answer to that depending on whether your goal is to um, have the students, whether the goal is for the students to learn something about the rules um, or to use the rules as of a game, right, as a as a mechanism for interacting with a particular kind of content. So, for example, you know, um, sometimes we play Jeopardy review before a midterm, right, that kind of thing. Um, if your goal is simply to look for rules as a more interesting way to interact with a piece of content than you know just sort of me telling it to you, right? Um, there's lots and lots of those that you can import, and those actually will come up if you just Google them. Um, you know, just sort of sort of those kind of templates. Um, this probably wasn't your question, but I think it's interesting, like so I'm going to answer it. Yeah. Sugar for the content. Make it easier yeah. to take down. Right, exactly. Um, the other side of that is there's also other kinds of games that if you are interested in having that kind of, um, the rules are part of what teaches you something interesting. I think there are ways to do that. They're, they're much more complicated and fewer and far between. Dylan and I are looking right now at the possibility of using like role-playing games and like tabletop games, RPG games. Um, and using those as a, as a learning tool, because there are some of those that you can sort of, if you're willing to be creative, build out. Um, but I have to say some of the best advice I got from somebody like really early into this project was to make sure that the games were fun. Uh, because if they weren't fun, it was not going to help in any way at all for me to use them. And so that, that was her advice, was to use games that we know are fun to play and see if you can adapt games that are out there on the market. And one of the best ways to do that is to go to places where people are, go to game nights, you know, at game stores and play games with people and see, you know, first just go with the aim of having a fun experience, but you may pick up something and go, oh yeah, I could use this in this way. I just want to throw in one quick thought because it ties in very much to my research. The second type of game where the rules are about 
help you understand whatever you're trying to teach. Um, I think that's really hard, and I think yeah. in terms of making games, we are kind of in like 1915 for film, right? The equivalent or something, you know, we're still yeah. figuring out what it means for games to be meaningful or about mm -hmm. subjects. And so it's a very exciting time, but like, no, those templates don't really exist. Um, though I have made a template-based game generator. It's really important, just on the templates before I forget, it's really important to understand that um, game design is the sort of, it's, it's a practice and there are lots of people who've been, who have designed games who aren't necessarily good game designers. So um, one of the things that I often bring up is uh, a school called Quest to Learn, based in New York, I think they're starting one in Chicago, and it is game-based education for fourth through, I think now they're seventh or eighth graders. And what they do, their secret sauce is, two game designers, full-time employees who work with subject matter experts who deliver the content. So a teacher says, this is what I need to deliver, and then a designer permutes that into something that is fun. There's, she's been holding for a while. Go for it. Uh, I'll be teaching um, business policy and strategy, and I took the class last semester and we do a simulation, which is a very large part of it, and it's excellent. It reinforces all, it, it's in the senior BBA capstan course. It reinforces all of the skills you learn in business. However, what, what the students don't do is, and what I saw happening, they go in without you know, thinking they can shoot from the hip. Like they go into a video place and that, you know, um, putting, filling in the blanks was an end in itself when the real end was doing the preliminary work, the analysis with which to fill in the blanks. So what I'm asking is, what is the difference between rules and instructions? Because if you didn't invest around two hours with the very good tutorials that come with it, you don't enjoy it, you don't have a good experience for the 13 weeks it lasts. I know you mentioned the word game over. How that sort of from your generation, how can I sort of say, if you don't invest two hours looking yep. at those videos, yep. game over before it starts? What's a sort of the modern question, way to say that? My answer is actually in your question. So a good game designer would have um, really designed a rule set that prevents them from succeeding without those specific requirements. And a lot of simulations wrestle with this. They want to simulate and they don't tend to integrate rule sets that also meet the objectives of the educational agenda. So um, instructions are sort of consumer end and rule sets are really what says I can play or I can't play. And one of the things that, that's like very common that I've seen in a lot of um, simulation games uh, think of it this way, I have a bunch of things I'm supposed to be doing, but as a player, play space is experimental. I can just kind of diddle around as much as I want to. And that's natural, that's how we play. What the game should do is drive you towards an objective, and those objectives should be quantifiable or something we can say, they have demonstrated a competency here. And this is extraordinarily common in what we call AAA games, so console games do this all the time. You cannot go to the next level until you demonstrate that you can shoot or you can manage your group or whatever you have to do. But a lot of developers of simulation are good developers of simulation, not game. I think this is a good um, reason to advocate for game design as a discipline. I mean, that's what a game designer does is they make it, uh, make the gameplay, the desired gameplay experience accessible to players. And I empathize with you on this as a struggle because I used to design debate simulations and all United Nations simulations. And man, if people showed up and they did not know what small arms were, we were going to have a real boring weekend, <laughs> right? Like if they hadn't done this sort of prep work. Um, and I worked for different conferences that had different strategies for dealing with that. Um, the most effective that I ever found, which is probably is kind of a boring answer, but the most effective that I ever had was they had to write. They had to write stuff before they showed up, and you really couldn't. It was easier to do the work of doing the research to write the thing than to try to not do the research to write the yeah. thing. 
Um, so they had to write a position paper, but they also had to write a proposal where they proposed some solution to whatever it was, right? It didn't matter if it was any good or not. They just had to write something. Um, and that, in general, made most people show up prepared. Now, sometimes you would have people who their team captains would write the papers for everybody on the team, and other people would just show up and screw around all weekend. And I don't understand why anybody would volunteer to do that, because it was super boring and not fun. But I totally get that, like, especially if you're going to do simulation, and especially if you're going to do it long term, you got to have something built in where people demonstrate before they can go forward that they've laid that sort of groundwork level knowledge and competency. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and to, to piggyback on what Lindsay and Mike are saying, um, the modern console game, the modern AAA, has a tutorial where, you know, your character will, will walk on the screen and they say, the shoot press blank, shoot these three targets, and then you actually have to do it, right? And then you go to the next thing, and it's another tutorial that says, to jump in this way, press this button, blah, 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 blah. So a tutorial perhaps will bridge the ludic, which is the rules, versus the mechanic, which is the, the how you move and the design. So maybe a tutorial at the beginning of your game would sort of say, you know, here's, here's the rules, but this is the way you play the game, at the same time that it's giving you the rules. And I can almost imagine like a mini simulation where before you start the big simulation, right, you have kind of a smaller version, and if they show up and they didn't do any of the things you asked them to do beforehand, and it's terrible. You can be like, well, was that super boring? Yeah, do you want to spend the next 13 weeks of your life like that? I don't know, maybe I have greater faith than people. <laughs> <laughs> you talk more about evaluating student learning. Particularly with the more open-ended games or simulations, not where you have like, advanced next level. Do you have any advice for them to I have a, uh, an assignment I've been testing for use of the pandemic, right, because one of my goals there is for them to get this kind of deep structural knowledge of a system, um, which is hard to evaluate. Um, one of the ways that I've sort of proposed doing that, and I wish I could tell you that it works super awesome, but I haven't done it yet, um, is that one of the assignments they can choose to write is to propose a rule change to the game and talk about what they think would happen if, they, if we change the rules in a particular way. So it's a two-part assignment they have to write about what rule they would change and what they think, what change in the sort of outcomes or gameplay that would produce, um, which requires them to sort of understand the rules, right, as they are. And then they have to get together with their friends at home because they do these assignments after they go home from my class, um, play the game and see if what they thought would happen would happen, and then talk about sort of reflectively about what that, you know, said about what they thought about the rules or not. More critical media consumption. Asking yourself, what, I, what did I just do and how would I change that to meet some other objectives. I think it's a great suggestion. Uh, the other thing that we, uh, you'll see lots of these uh, on the academic game side, there's a lot of people are just doing pre and post surveys, uh, and they're fine, they're not particularly exciting, but they work. Uh, and I've seen other educators, you know, I'm teaching a lot of game design, so it's sort of tricky. There are games about designing games. Um, uh, game Star Mechanic is the sort of classic example. Uh, but one of the challenges is just, you, you need to know where your baseline is, right? So that's why the pre works so well. And then um, I've seen people do things like ask someone about, I'll think the Assassin's Creed example again is a good one. This is a sort of a stealth shooting game, would you call it, with a very rich narrative. Um, and in Assassin's Creed, you see a tremendous amount of, um, of period architecture, and you are playing through specific historical uh, events. And so I've seen people write effectively as academics about how they've diagnosed that basically by saying, tell me everything you know now, let's play the game, I'm gonna assign these specific levels, give them save games, and then ask them about them, and then we should just demonstrate how much more rich their understanding of the scenario is. I, I think um, it's, uh, I, I'd say as a field, it's something that's still being worked out fully, and I think that there are I don't know, 20 years of awful educational games uh, because that question isn't there's a lot of progress has been made recently, I think. Um, but yeah, it's very important. Especially these more uh, understanding like what these games procedurally represent. It's really hard to measure that. Because what you're trying to do is teach a, a different order of thinking and facts, but the things that generate facts. So. Go ahead. Uh, Lindsay, you mentioned that you have a lot of 
about the digital games. Uh, can you explain how does it actually look in the classroom? Uh, so it's one thing to think about games that students play uh, in, a, uh, in an online class or at home, uh, but in the classroom, if, if you're talking about a classroom that is not in a computer lab, uh, do they sit each by their own laptop uh, or, uh, or iPhone? And uh, what do we do if they don't, uh, if, if not all of them uh, own a compatible um, a, a device? So I think it depends on your objective. Uh, so there are times that I want to demonstrate a particular mechanic. Um, so a, a way that something is accomplished or a rule set that has to do with solving the, the conflict, the problem. And in those cases, often what I'll do is sort of fast forward, ask for a volunteer, do a big screen projection, and let everybody get that aha moment at the same time, witnessing it. And part of that trick is that I want to bait students into investigating the game on their own. So um, they see something, they go, oh my god, I can't believe someone made a game about this. I wonder what else is in there. Yeah. Right? So it's like showing someone a teaser for a film. Uh, that works well when I know I have a rich experience I can't deliver in class. I tend to use short pointed games because that's the way I teach. So I have that, that bias. Uh, one of my challenges with board games is the setup and that same thing of scale. Uh, running three different games of Pandemic in class uh, isn't very easy. Uh, and so what happens is the, the, the board games have some challenges and some benefits. Digital games have some, and you have to play to those strengths. Uh, there are a lot of digital games that are enormous. And so more often than not, I'll end up showing something. If, it's a, if I want them to understand a AAA game, a, a big console game, I'll actually show something in class as a teaser, usually just uh, some section of playthrough, and then ask them to do it as part of a library resource so they can check out the game. And I encourage them to play together because it changes, a di it changes the dynamic. It's not, I'm assigned to watching this by myself or playing this by myself. It's more sort of, oh, what if you tried this? Like they, they collaborate problem solve and all this. Mess. But I've also seen, last note, I've also seen um, one of my peers at the last institution I taught at uh, used um, games like Call of Duty to investigate um, team management. And so he would say on the first day, when students don't have a lot of skills in the topic anyway, we're going to play Call of Duty, or we're going to play some game that requires you to manage a squad, and we're going to talk about that experience afterwards. So sort of, it's light, it's easy, um, intimidating for people who've never played those sorts of games, which is why you have to have a, sort of a gamer audience. Um, but there, it's really, it's, it's matching. I think often people are looking for a one-size-fits-all solution. It really depends on both your teaching objectives and um, the sort of the scale of your class, the thing you want them to get, how you want to deliver it. So I don't have a, I don't have a simple answer. <laughs> well, I just had a quick question about the military uh, budget in terms of gaming and uh, the Defense Department, State Department. They do all these book simulations of World War III and, and various things. So there's a lot of money flowing through uh, your departments um, from the military, or can't you talk about that? No, we've been here for uh, a few months. Um, I have historically been funded on the DARPA grant for uh, some of my grad work. And we've got like, fun stuff. That was actually really a neat project, too. I thought that was the beginning of a joke you were about to tell. No, no, no. Real life. Yeah. Wow. Real life. Yeah. Uh, and I, from my perspective, I haven't. Um, I haven't done that, but I tend to, I bias away from simulation and more towards mechanics and social impact. Yeah. I'll say um, some of the money coming from places like DARPA, yeah, it's surprising what they're funding. Um, they very large grants uh, funding a bunch of social scientists to help people learn how to act in unknown cultures, not like a specific culture, but they're li just trying to train soldiers to be um, good strangers, so they want training. Uh, like how to be nice for some idiot 18 year old who's going to be a jerk, right? Um, and then also a bunch of like math games because they want to promote math, and so millions of dollars are coming from. And I have to say, I did, so several years ago, I was doing research on digital simulation as training, and um, there was, uh, after I left the project, because I've been working with that long, a um, lot of money flowing in that direction, and maybe should have stayed on that project a little longer, actually. Um, but yeah, there's a, I think there's a lot of increasing interest in, in other ways of training people, and other ways of teaching, and other ways of you know, developing complex skill sets, because, you know, it's one thing to teach people language by locking them in a classroom for 12 hours a day for 18 weeks or whatever it is that they do at the State Department these days. But, you know, if your goal is to teach people well, how do you get through a checkpoint in kind of a 
dubious security scenario without losing too many of your aid supplies, right? Like there's clearly some really valuable skill sets that you can teach with simulations and games at the, the international level, I think. So increasing interest, I would say. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I teach a lot online and I've experimented with different ways of content delivery. You know, we started out with voice over PowerPoint and then it was PowerPoint with little lectures embedded and now it's my talking and you know words flying in and then you have to pause the screen and I guess I'm just wondering I'm really interested in figuring out how to use gaming in terms of the content delivery of my online courses but I just don't know where to start besides going to Google and being like you know content delivery online course or just coming up with what kind of courses do you teach? Um, I teach a number of different courses. One of the courses I teach is an international development course that uses uses novels and music and films from the global south to engage students in issues of international development. Mm -hmm. Another course I teach is on governance in Africa, and it does the same thing except it's films and music and uh, novels from Africa to discuss issues of governance. Uh, do you think you want to use um, what, what I call the unique aspects of games to express something about <coughs> these subjects in a way that film or music couldn't? Or do you think you want to use games to help motivate students to keep going probably, through the course? Probably motivate students. So I would look up the word gamification, then apply it in various, um, uh, a lot of, I think some educational um, learning is using it. So the short version for gamification, if you don't know it, for the rest of the audience, is basically um, combining uh, game design and motivation systems inherent in games with uh, basic concepts from loyalty programs uh, so that you keep people engaged long enough to get to the next step. Uh, is that the sort of thing you're looking for? Or are you looking more for like examples or things you can... I just don't know where to start. Yeah, yeah. That, I would start with that. And I think it's for structuring like, like in Google searching that, you'll see some good... Uh, and then the other side is I'd always, I, I think it, the easy thing for um, educators to consider is just to use the games as um, a, just another medium. Uh, so you know how to use video in your class and you know how to, so I would just... It's just something different, you know? Yeah. 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 I get it also, maybe just because lately I'm like really obsessed with like maybe designing like tabletops for learning. Um, Dungeons and Dragons for learning. Um, I think an online course could actually be like a really cool venue for an ongoing sort of role-playing game and sets of sort of simulations like that where people are just sort of drop. I, so my early problem with simulation learning was that when you sort of drop people into a scenario with characters and you gave them two lines about who they were, they were kind of married to that and they were static and they couldn't be dynamic and, and do all the things that people do in scenarios, right, which is change their minds and learn and compromise and all those good things, right? Um, but I think if you sort of have a different mindset towards simulation where you're talking about embodying a character and what would you do if you were this person, right? If you were in this scenario as opposed to, okay, you care about this and I'm going to tell you what you care about and what your goal is and if you don't get that, you hate it. Um, I think that particularly in development, right, and if we're talking about different ways of interacting with the structures and systems of international development, there's actually some really cool potential for role playing there. It would be hard, but it would be super fun. Any other burning question, I think we're at the time. Um, I just have one comment that Dylan emails me. He says okay. that he's sorry that he couldn't talk to you. He promises he was here the whole time and he likes you. Um, uh, his addition is to say that people shouldn't confuse the recreational good game outcome, people had fun, somebody won, with a rhetorical or pedagogical outcome that's desirable in a learning setting, um, which is that something is learned even through failure, uh, and especially through discussing why failure happened, right? Um, uh, through, or sorry, through failure, and especially about discussing strategic interactions, perceptions, and misunderstandings. When people confuse those two things, right, like somebody won the game and that was the ideal outcome, right, or they didn't win the game, they think, oh, I need to be good at games and my students have to play them all the way through to complete the game uh, in order to get anything out of it, which is not true, right, they, and then they don't try. Um, and instead, we should figure that gaming is a chance to discuss rules and it's not um, always totally important to play it uh, the same way you would if you were just like playing it for fun, and it's not always necessarily totally important to finish the game. Like for example, signing three levels out of you know Assassin's Creed or whatever, um, which I think is a helpful a helpful distinction. Right? They can be still valuable even if you would think it was kind of a failure on failing game. Other questions? Other comments? What's your email? Oh, what's my email? 
Do we maybe have cards or something? Where, there's a Blackboard site for this section. Oh. If you're registered for it, I think you can get it all the Blackboards. We'll, we'll post everybody's contact information there. So I'm easy to find. Professorgrace.com. I just just Professor Grace. Professor Grace. 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 Yeah, yeah we're easy. Great. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Give her five cards in that. Okay. Great. Oh. Great.